Okay, I, I would like to, there was a there was a problem on the the 12-3 assignment part two. That's a lot of, it's a hard question. A lot of people had questions on this. Some people have been successful, but there's a little bit to this. And this, there's some excellent algebra here. If you can understand this problem, that puts you in really good shape. Travis, can I get you guys attention, please? Yes, uh, question, can I? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, when we do stuff like this, when we're, we're asked to find the missing dimension H, given the surface area, okay, they tell us the surface area is 1,411 square units, you know, whatever we're measuring in, okay? Uh, we want to be able to solve for H. Okay? We always want to start off with the formula. Now, so this is what kind of shape? Pyramid. Pyramid. So we want the surface area of a pyramid. Well, go ahead. Well, S equals what? Good, good. Okay, S equals B plus one half PL. One half PL. Okay. And what does B stand for? Base. The, in fact, what about the base? Area. Area of the base. Good. And P stands for? Perimeter. Perimeter of the base. Very good. And L, L is the part that's a little bit tricky. What's L? Slant, slant height. Uh -huh. Okay, so L is the slant height. Now, the slant height is going to show up here, isn't it? <coughs> so that's L, right? That we need to get that in our formula, don't we? Right? Somehow. Uh, what makes this tricky? This would be a somewhat difficult problem if we had to just calculate the surface area, but that's not what we're doing. We're supposed to, within this formula, we've got to find the value of H that makes the surface area equal to 1,411, right? So we need to be able to plug in the stuff that we know, and wherever the H shows up, we're going to want to isolate it. Okay, so what is, now keep in mind here that X is, X is a little tricky. X is the length of the bottom of this right triangle. So what is the length of the base edge? 14. Ah, okay, if X is 7, then this is 2 times that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Right? So the length of the base edge is 14, correct. 14 by 14, right? Say that again. Uh, because because X is pointing to this this area just right there, right? And that's only half because this is a regular pyramid. That's the exact center of that of that base, right? That square base. Okay. Okay, makes sense. So then, what is we can plug some stuff in. What is the base area then? About about forty nine. Ah, okay, it's 14 times 14, isn't it? So the base area is 14 squared. 14 times 14, which is 196. Okay, make sense? Okay, so we know what B is. We can put a number in for B. Uh, what's B? 14 times 4. If, if each of the base edges are 14, and there's four of them, then the perimeter is just 4 times 14, which is what, 28 times 2, 56? So that's pretty good. We've got, of, of the stuff up here now, we know S, we know B, and we know P. Right? Okay? That's pretty good. We know a lot of this stuff. What about L, though? What, we don't know L. It's not given to us. And to find L, now here's the thing that you always want to remember. L and H for pyramids, for cones, for all that stuff. L and H are always going to be related by a, a right triangle. So we want to just, we want to access that right triangle. Now we know the bottom edge of that right triangle is 7. We know that the slant height is L, and the height we're calling H. Now H is what we're trying to solve for, right? Here's our right triangle. Well, what does the Pythagorean theorem tell us about the relationship of those parts of the height, the base, which is length 7, 
and the slant height, which is the hypotenuse of that triangle. B squared. Okay, A squared plus B squared equals C squared for a, for a, a right triangle. Mm -hmm. In this case, C is always the hypotenuse. So in this case, C is L. L. Okay, so then we end up with L squared equals what? H squared, good. Plus seven squared, uh huh. Which is just 49, right? And so then if I solve for L, what is L? How do I, how do I, if L squared equals this stuff, what is L equal? Okay, Travis, I'm gonna ask you one more time. Please get your stuff out and pay attention. After this, I'm going to ask you to go in the hall. Okay. So I, what do I do to get the L by itself? How do I undo the square? Square root. Square root, square root of H squared plus 49. Good. And that's what... No, no. I, I think you can get it. Yeah. Okay. So L goes right there in our formula, right? Okay, and let's let's plug in stuff that we know now. Okay, we know that S is equal to, they told us it was 14, 11, right? So there's our S. We calculated B as 196. We calculated P to be 56. So then what would one half P be equal to if P is 56? Half of it, which you may know what that is? No? 28. Good. So that would become a 28. And then we get our L, right? And our L is just going to look like square root of H squared plus 49. Does that make sense? <coughs> So just to rehash what we've done there, we've taken the original formula for surface area and we've plugged in everything that we know. Okay. If we're going to solve for H or isolate H now, that's our goal, right? But remember our rule in algebra, and we're going to talk an awful lot about this next year. We've talked about it a little bit this year. Next year, this gets to be a big deal. If we can point to a single variable, we can always isolate it. What's our strategy for isolating a variable? How do we do that? <coughs> Say it again. Get everything on the other side, but how do we know what order to do stuff in to get it by itself? PEMDAS backwards, right? When we isolate something, we go backwards through PEMDAS. Now let's let's do that. Let's go. I'm gonna grab this thing, give us a little more room here. We're gonna need more room than that. So I'm gonna grab this and we'll go to the next page. And we'll just work on that isolating process. Okay, so if I want to isolate H, here's what we got to do, right? We're going to go backwards through PEMDAS. So what's the first thing we would do then? We're going to add or subtract. Subtract what? 196. There's the number that's being added to the H, right? So we're going to undo that by subtracting. All right, so if we subtract, if we subtract 196 from both sides, it goes away from this side, right? 196 minus 196 is zero, so that goes away. And on the other side, I get what? Somebody, let me have a calculator hand. Like I said, I've got one here. We'll just. What is it again? 1215. 1215? Okay, yeah. Okay, looks good. So 1215 equals 28 times the square root of h squared plus 49. So there was the add subtract step. Now we move up to multiply or divide. Divide by what? 28. 28. Okay, now here's a common mistake people make. People want to divide by 28 times the square root of some stuff, but we can't do that yet. 
the square root, where does the square root come in? This is a little bit weird, and we'll talk a lot more about this next year, but a square root acts just like an exponent. Okay, and there's a reason for that. The reason that a square root acts like an exponent is this. Because the square root of something, say the square root of 9, can be written as 9 to the 1 half power. Same thing exactly. Now, we won't talk about that in detail until next year. But therefore, every time we see a radical, we know that it can be written as an exponent, so it counts as an exponent. Okay? So, we don't get to the square root until we get up to this e step, right? We're going to divide both sides by 28, because that's what's being multiplied by the square root. If it's next to it, it's being multiplied. Make sense? Okay? So if we divide both sides by 28, 28 does not go evenly into 1215. How do I know that, by the way? Well, yeah, if 1215 ends in a 5, it's only divisible by things that end in 5s, right? Okay. I mean, it's, it's got to be, this thing down here would have to have a 5 in it. Well, I say that's not true, is it? It's not necessarily true, but 28 won't go into that. Okay, it won't go into it. If, if we try, we're going to get a decimal. And if anybody wants to, they can try it, but it won't work. Now, we don't want to probably write that out as a decimal because we'd have to round it. And, you know, why don't we just leave it like this? That's fine. We can leave it as a fraction. That's an exact answer. So then we end up with, now, we're just working along here. Now we've got, on the right side, the square root of h squared plus 49 equals this fraction, 12, 15 over 28, which our calculator will eventually tell us an answer to. We don't get there when we get there. Now what do we do? No, we're on the exponent step, right? Remember, the radical acts like an exponent. So how do I undo a square root? A square it. Square both sides. Aha. Let's try that. So if I square both sides, look what happens. The square root and the square cancel. And there's a little, well, you know, never mind. Uh, so I'll square both sides. I have to square this side also. Okay, that's just going to be some big number. We'll get there when we get there. Okay. On the right side, now look what we're left with. It's getting better. On the right side, now we've gotten rid of the radical, so we just have an h squared plus 49. Now what do I do? Okay, now I can subtract 49. Because now all of a sudden I've got this 49 that's being added. And so that's I got, I got to start the order of operations over again. Okay. So we'll subtract 49. 12, 15 over 28 squared minus 49. That'll push the 49 over there, right? And we end up with h squared, and what's the last step? How do I undo a square? Square root, sure. So I'll square root both sides, and the square root and the square cancel, and I got it. h is equal to that big mess, okay? Right? Now, that's a that's the exact answer. What does that look like? Well, we could pull up the graphing calculator and, and see. It's going to be a decimal for sure, yeah. But that's okay if it's a decimal. I don't think I did mind that. I can't. Um, yeah, I can't. Okay, let's go through. And then I want to show you maybe a way we could have done this onto the calculator that was a little bit easier. Uh, we're getting to a point with some of these calculations where they get so big and there's so many steps to it that the graphing calculator thing gets to be pretty important. Now, you may not have a graphing calculator, but I'm going to try to do my best to get that classroom set while we're working on these kinds of problems. So you guys can, because I want you to learn how to use them anyway. You're going to need them in Algebra 2. 
Algebra 2, we will use them every day. And so, uh, yes, what? Where do you get the emulation software? Uh, well, it's very expensive. Yeah. So it's I, there's nothing that we have that we can really offer right now in terms of emulation software. Is, is the calculator cheaper? Uh, no, it's cheaper than the calculator, but it's still pretty expensive. I can tell you about it later if you're interested. What's that? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so now how could we use the calculator to do all this stuff? Let's take a look. So if I want to, if I want to take the square root of all this stuff, I could do all this on the calculator pretty easily. If you have a graphing calculator, the nice thing is when I put in square root. looks like a square root and so then I can put it in just like this I could take the quantity 12 15 divided by 28 in parentheses squared minus 49 right everybody agree that's that's what I want to do whenever I have a fraction if I put it in parentheses the calculator will see it like just a regular number there it is there's my answer, 42.82. I ran it two places. Okay? A lot of stuff. Now, how could we maybe have used the calculator to get to that a little quicker? I'm going to go through one more thing. Now, this is, this is fine. This is a good way to do it if you just write out the algebra. But we also could have done this. Go right there. Okay, what if I go... Okay, let's go back up to here. And, and just solve for h into the calculator. I want to show you something really cool here that's, that's you're going to like. Oh, did I get rid of that? That was dumb. Oh, no, I didn't. There it is. Okay. If I want to solve for, if I want to solve for h, get h by itself, let's go through all these steps that we had. Uh, in fact, let me do this. steps I would go through to get the H by itself into the calculator. This is really valuable. I could start with, I'm going to open up a set of parentheses on the other side. I've already got a 1411 there. Okay, what do I do first to get that H by itself? Subtract 196. Okay, so we'll subtract 196. And then I'm going to end up dividing that by 28, right? So I'm going to close the parentheses because all that stuff is going to get divided by something. Okay, while we go along, let's just, I'll just kind of block out the things that we've gotten rid of. So we got rid of that guy, right? Okay, we subtracted 196. Now we divide by 28, right? So divided by 28, okay? And then that gets rid of him. Right? Okay. Now, it starts to get complicated here now. So if I want to, I can even hit enter and get an answer. There it is. Okay. 43.39. In fact, if I want to, I could even do this. I could even say uh, 1411 without the parentheses minus 196 we did first, right? Enter. Get an answer if I want to. And then if I just hit divided by, it takes that whole answer and divides by 28. Notice I get the same answer. Okay, right? Uh, now what? What did I do to both sides? Square error. Okay, so now watch. If I say, if I just push the squared button, it says my previous answer squared. How about that? There it is. That's what I got. So that got rid of, that got rid of this. I mean, it's hard to do. There. So the square root's gone. Now what? Subtract by 49. Subtract 49. So I'll just say minus. It says my last answer, minus 49. Okay, gives me that. Good. So we got rid of this. Now what? Square root. Square, square root. root. Okay, to do the square root, I, I actually do have to be a little bit tricky here. I've got to go second square root. And it doesn't put the answer in there, but with the new operating system, I can just go up and grab it. 
put it inside the radical. Enter. Here's my answer. Same as before. How about that? Isn't that handy? <coughs> Okay, so I will. We've got the new calculators. They've got the new operating system. If you don't have one, you know, I'll make those available in the lab for us to use. We're done with the state testing, so I should have access to them. Okay. Questions on that? Okay. This is on video, so you can go back and look at this morning. All right. So then, <clears throat> that's the question I wanted to go to from the old stuff. I want to take a quick look at. this stuff. Okay, surface areas and volumes of spheres. No big deal. They're just formulas. Just formulas. So it's, it's not hard to do. Finding the surface area of the sphere. If, if we, uh, we want to be able to find surface area and volume, there's, there's some stuff we need to know about spheres, some definitions. We know that the best definition, first of all, of a sphere is that it is a locus of points. And when we say the word locus in math, it just means a set. This means a set of points that fit a certain description or criteria. It's the locus of points uh, in a plane, if we look at a circle, that are uh, equidistant from some point at the middle. Okay, so in other words, if I'm gonna draw a if I'm gonna draw a circle, all I have to know about this, and this is pretty important, all I have to know is that if I have some given point and I know what the radius is. It's the set of all the points that are a certain distance away from that center. The only shape they could have if they're all going to be the same distance away is a circle, right? That radius right there is the same as that radius right there, which is the same as that radius right there, right? Now, if I'm going to 3 d that, make it three-dimensional instead of two-dimensional, instead of a circle, it becomes a sphere. Imagine I keep the same point, but now instead of not just drawing on the board, I could draw out here as well, or behind the board. You can kind of get a picture then that the collection of all those circles I could make would add up into a sphere, right? And that's what we get. So we still have a center of a sphere. We still have a radius of a sphere, even though it's three-dimensional. Uh, we still have a diameter, for that matter. Diameter would just be the straight segment that, that travels through the center and connects to the surface, right? And then we talk about a chord. Uh, a chord is just uh, it's just any point that, that connects endpoints on the surface, okay, that are on the sphere. Okay, nothing too spectacularly difficult about any of this stuff. Diameter is just a chord that contains the center. Okay. All right, and then we get some formulas. Surface area. The surface area of a sphere is instead of just being the surface area or the area of a circle was pi r squared, the surface area of a sphere looks pretty similar. It's 4 pi r squared. Of course it's bigger because the, the sphere is rounded and it has more surface on it than just that plain little circle, right? Four times as much in fact. Okay? I want you to notice something here. And we'll, I'm going to talk more about this, I think, on the Friday, this Friday, the Friday before spring break. I want to take a second. I want to, I want to show you something really interesting about why it is. Geometry tells us this. Why it is that when you watch a movie that involves large creatures, King Kong, or large insects. What's, what's the one where the older movie? Uh, Starship Trooper? Starship Trooper, yeah. All the insects are always the bad guys, right? All those movies where the insects, they get these enormous insects that are the bad guys, it's completely false. It never happened. And we'll, we'll, we'll look at, we can easily see why on Friday. It has to do with this concept right here. What happens when you double the radius? What happens to the surface area? If the radius starts off two inches and we double that to four inches, what happens to the surface area in the process? It gets bigger, but how much bigger? Well, if we apply the formulas, if r is 2, then 4 pi r squared, 4 times pi times 2 squared, is just 4 times pi times 4. 4 times 4 is 16. So if r is 2 inches, the surface area is 16 times pi square inches. What if r is 4, though? Notice that now instead of squaring 2, we're squaring 4. Yikes. And that makes it 4 times 16, which is 64. So the surface area ends up being 64 times pi squared inches, 
Well, that's four times bigger. 16 times four is 64. So when we doubled the radius, we quadrupled the surface area. Okay, and, and we'll see a trend there that has something to do with, with this, my, my, my proof on Friday that these movies are totally fake and it could never happen. It has to do with this concept, but we'll get there later. Okay, so uh, if a plane intersects a sphere, the intersection is always a circle, right? If that intersection includes the center, we call it a great circle, just another vocabulary word, sort of the anatomy of a sphere. Those are great circles. Uh, all great circles are the same. Okay, they're all congruent. They're all the same size. They have the same radius as the sphere. And every time that we, we, we cut a, a sphere into a great circle, right, we're going to cut it through its center, we always split the sphere into two hemispheres. Hemi just means half. Okay, so we get two half spheres or hemispheres. Okay. Uh, okay, what about this? What if we're given this problem? The circumference of a great circle of a sphere, we're, we're told that it's 13.8 times pi feet. What is the surface area of the sphere? Any idea how we could do that? If we're given the circumference, how could we find surface area? Any ideas? To find surface area, remember, what's our formula? What's the formula for surface area of a sphere? 4 pi r squared. So to find surface area, we need radius. They didn't give us radius directly, though. They gave us circumference. What's the, what's the formula for circumference? Remember? No, that's area is pi r squared. Circumference is... 2 pi r. Okay, so if they gave us circumference, we could actually find radius, though, couldn't we? Right, because we know the circumference is related to the radius by this equation, right? So we can do this. Okay, we can find the radius of the, of the sphere by setting circumference equal to 2 pi r. I could, uh, I could divide... To solve for r, I would divide both sides by 2 pi. Algebraically, what happens if I have a pi divided by a pi? They cancel. They cancel. Good. So those go away. I just get 13.8 over 2, which is 6.9. So the radius is 6.9. I can feed that into the surface area equation now. Right? 4 times pi times 6.9 squared, which is just a number. Our calculator would tell us that's about 190.44 pi. And I could even put in the value for pi if I want to and make it one big decimal. But now I know the surface area. Why did you know what chord it is? Chord, it'll, it'll come up. It'll come up. It's not, yeah. It's, it, it comes up on the assignment. It'll come up more in future years. We're not going to do a lot with it this year, but it's, a, it's an important definition. That's a big part of math, even though we don't deal with it a lot this year. Yes, sir? Yeah, go ahead. So we got surface area. Okay, now finding the volume. This is this is pretty cool. If you're a math person, this is I want you to really notice this. We're going to do something that is almost like calculus here. I think this is really cool that we're able to do this. We can come up with the volume formula for a sphere, and later on, those of you that I've got in calculus, we'll come back and look at this in more detail. This exact problem, and talk about why this works. Think of it this way now. If, if I take a sphere and I'm going to cut this thing up, I'm going to slice it up into a bunch of pieces. I'm just going to cut all the way through the middle in all these directions, just like I'm cutting through an apple. But every cut I make goes through the center. Some of my cuts are going to be vertical. Some are going to be horizontal. Would you agree if I did that, that I'm going to create a whole bunch of these little sort of pyramid-shaped guys? Right? They're going to look like this. They're going to have a, a square-looking surface. Now, there's a little bit of curvature to that, isn't there? Right? The, the, would you agree the surface of that is going to have just a little bit of roundedness to it? Yeah. But also, the smaller I make those pieces, the less obvious that curvature is. Right? If I make them really small, you can hardly even tell that they're curved. In the same way that when you're on the surface of the Earth, because you're really small compared to the enormous size of the Earth, so you're on a boat on the ocean, it's really hard to tell that it's curved. It looks pretty flat. 
But if you look from the moon, you can see, obviously, it's very curved. Right? So if we can make something really small compared to the overall size of the object, even if it's a sphere, the curvature starts to disappear. It starts to get less obvious, and it starts to look like an actual pyramid instead of just an approximation of a pyramid. The roundedness on the base starts to become not that big a deal. Now, we know how to calculate the volume of a pyramid. Right? That's just one-third the base times the radius, or times the height, right? So isn't the, the volume of this pyramid that we've created then just call that B, the base area, call it B. And the height of the pyramid is the same thing as the radius of the sphere, isn't it? Everybody see that? So we could say it's really just one-third BR, right? Okay, now, if we were to add all of those volumes up then, for all of the pieces that we cut, that's going to add up to the overall volume of the sphere. Everybody following me? This is, this is really cool if you follow this. I promise you. This is, this is pretty interesting that it works out the way it does. Let's just say we have n of those pieces. n is going to be a big number. We have lots and lots of them. Okay? If we want to add those things up, wouldn't you agree then that, that if I add up all of the surface surfaces, or all of the, the bases of those pyramids, isn't that going to have to add up to the surface area of the sphere? Doesn't that make sense? Because they've all been cut from that sphere. So if each one of these has an area of B, all of them put together has to equal 4 pi r squared, right? So all n of them, and n's a big number, n times B is going to be 4 pi r squared, because we know that to be the surface area of the sphere, right? Now look at the algebra we can do with this. We know that the volume, then, is going to be about equal to, it's about equal to because there's a, it's not, there's a little bit of curvature there. But if we cut these things small enough, this starts to become exactly equal to uh, n of these pyramids, right? n times each pyramid had a volume of 1 third times the base times the height of the pyramid is the radius of the sphere, right? Well, let's just shuffle these things around a little bit. Now, we know mathematically, and you guys know this from Algebra 1, that when I multiply a string of things together, multiplication is commutative and associative. So I can multiply them in any order I want to. Let's regroup these things. Let's move the n over with the b. So we get 1 third times n times b times r. Well, you guys already told me, or agreed with me at least, that n times b the number of cuts times the base area of each pyramid has to add up to the whole surface of the sphere, right? So we know that n times b is really just 4 pi r squared. If I multiply this out, then the volume of the sphere is just 1 third times 4, which is 4 thirds, times pi times r squared times r. That's just pi r cubed, right? That is the formula for the volume of a sphere. Very tricky way to get it. It's 4 thirds pi r cubed. Okay? Amazing. We got that. But it works. Okay, last problem. Now, when, the, when you make ball bearings, you, the way you actually make them is you, you heat up. You heat up a, a slug, a cylindrical slug, and under really high pressure, you compress this thing into, there's a mold that compresses it into the shape of a sphere. And then it gets polished and all that stuff. But uh, when they, to make a certain ball bearing, we're going to use a slug here that's a cylinder, one centimeter in radius and two centimeters in height. So if I want to find out what the radius of the ball bearing is, how could I do that? And all that metal from the slug gets used in the ball bearing. What do you think? Uh, no, no, the, it, it can't get it can't get compressed into a smaller shape. The volume, you, you can't change the the density of the metal, right? So what has to be the same between those two? Mm, well, not necessarily. The surface area of the cylinder will be the same as the surface area. And, and that doesn't even necessarily have to be true either. I can prove it. Because what if I took something really obviously different? Like let's say I took a sheet of metal and I melted that down and put it in a spherical shape. 
Wouldn't the sheet of metal have a much bigger surface area than the, than the sphere? Uh, the volume has to be the same because the volume is accounts for the amount of metal, doesn't it? Right? The volume is how much metal is being used. So that has to be the same. The volume of the cylinder must equal the volume of the sphere. Right? So couldn't we then, couldn't we calculate, being as we know the radius and the height of the cylinder, we could calculate the amount of volume. And if we know the amount of volume, we could figure out the radius that fits that volume for a sphere, right? That works, right? So we know the formula for the volume of a cylinder. It's just pi r squared h, right? So if we plug in those values, the radius was 1 and the height was 2. So pi times 1 squared times 2 is just 2 pi. So the volume is 2 pi cubic centimeters of the cylinder. That's also the volume of the sphere, right? So if we just set that equal to 2 pi, we can solve for r. What do I do to solve for r? What would I do? First of all, I don't know, I, I can't remember how they do this, but we could do something a little trickier. Why don't we divide both sides by pi to get rid of those pi's? Right? So then I end up with 2 equals 4 thirds r cubed. Yeah, good. If I want to get rid of a fraction from this side, instead of dividing by the fraction, what if we multiply both sides by the reciprocal? Then the threes cancel and the four cancels, and I get r cubed equals 2 times 3 over 4 times 1. That's 6 over 4. Three halves. Right? And then, yeah, if I want to undo a cube, I'm going to cube root both sides. So r would equal the cube root of 3 halves. That's an exact answer. We can put it in our calculator if we want to and get a, 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 a decimal approximation. And if we do that, we end up with what? About 1.14 to two places. That's going to be the radius. That many centimeters, 1.14 centimeters. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Uh, because we just used our calculator to take a cube root of 3 halves, or 1.5, same thing. 3 halves is just 1 and a half, isn't it? Okay. And then you just cubed it. Cube rooted it, right? Which is, on, on a, it shows up on a calculator, it looks like this, doesn't it? Cube root is just... So we do the cube root of 1.5, which is the same thing, by the way, as 1.5 to the 3 halves power. Or, excuse me, 1 third power. Whoops. That's cube root, 1 third power. But we'll just do it, we would do it that way. That's fine. Okay, we got it. That's, we're starting to be able to do some bigger stuff now. I mean, it's, you move along in math, the things you can do get more interesting and more powerful. So, all right.